Thank you for joining my presentation. Yellow is the new green, rethinking automation success for the Automation Summit, November 2021. My name is Bill Roski. I am a principal consultant and quality architect for Cognizant South Vision. That means that I help our clients understand and build an automation and quality strategy for their products. I've been in the quality engineering and testing space for a little over 35 years. My contact information is on this slide, as well as on the uh, final slide of my presentation. So, how many of you have heard this question? When will the testing be green? In automation circles, in agile development, there's a lot of emphasis on automating test cases so that we can repeat them and provide an insurance policy for our products. I was at a conference some time back and a presenter, a presenter was talking about how she attacked this problem. She joined a project and the first question she was asked by management was, when is the testing going to be green? Green being everything's good to go for uh, release. But while I listened to that con conversation, there were some great things that she did to help improve the automation and uh, improve the testing process. But I kept thinking, is that the right question to be asking? And as I'm uh, likely to do oftentimes, I started kind of retrospecting on that and going, well, what is that question? And, and how do we deal with this question? Because I think there's an inherent problem in this question and, and um, this presentation is gonna to take us through that. I started thinking, who's asking that question? You know, who's asking when is testing gonna be green and why are they asking? Are they asking for a project status? Uh, you know, project managers like red, green, yellow, right? Uh, green is everything's good, red is everything's bad, yellow usually means we're trending in the wrong direction, right? But why are they asking? Is it just for status? And is the result of our automated regression being green, is that really a good indication? Um, is it for development? Uh, or deployment to the next environment? Is it good enough to go to the next environment? Or can we release to the client the ultimate environment, right? And what does that question mean to them? Why are they asking? What are they trying to get to? Are they really asking? Are all tests passing? Well, do all of our tests always pass? Are there bugs filed for failing tests? That's probably a better conversation is if they're not green, what's the dispensation of those defects that are represented? And are all bugs always, always closed before we release? And do we have control over that metric? We being quality engineers, we being the project, do we have control over uh, that metric to say, you know, all the tests are passing, all of the bugs that we filed have been fixed. You know, if you use Windows, if you use, honestly, if you use Macs, if you use a cell phone, you're painfully sometimes aware that none of that software is completely bug free. And I'd argue that a lot of commercial software, we have to balance the time to market to the totally perfect quality. And usually we fall somewhere in the middle there, right? And sometimes we fall more towards time to market. There's an opportunity cost to waiting until we have all of the bugs fixed. Now, if you're if you're building a, a nuclear submarine or a, a weapons firing system or a pacemaker, um, you're probably gonna want more quality and fewer bugs, right? But not of all, all of our software is that way. So, what does testing is green mean, right? If we think about that and we think about the current tools, they aggregate our regression results. And in this presentation, I'm focusing primarily on our automated repeatable tests, right? If you run any automated regression testing utility or tool, green means all the tests pass. Anything else, is not green, usually red, right? But 
open bugs are a completely separate thing. There are some great reporting tools, and I, in my humble opinion, some really lousy reporting tools. But all of them treat, all of them I should say that I've been exposed to, I've been exposed to a few, treat open bugs as a completely separate thing. At the same conference that I got the idea for this talk, I was speaking to a particular tool vendor and they were showing their regression result, their automated regression results analysis. And I said, well, you've got failures there. Are there bugs? Well, he said, you can you can click on the test and you see the results and then you can click here and it'll show you all of the open bugs. So if there are no open bugs, you know, there won't be any. I said, that's great. But if I have thousands of test cases, I may have even a 10% failing. I may have hundreds of failures. I want to know if I've already addressed those failures or not. So we talked about how could you add a flag that just says, yes, this test failed. But by the way, there's already an open bug. When we go back to what does green really mean? What does management really want to know? What they really want to know is, are we able to move forward to the next environment or to the next release? So the question becomes, is green really realistic? Is that really what we want to focus on? So I had a mentor early in my career when I was trying to put together a metrics program. And she had years of experience in quality, both in manufacturing and had uh, moved to the software industry. And she pointed out that whether it's manufacturing or software, you have to be careful how you define your metrics, because people will take the path of least resistance in order to make that metric look good. So if the path of least resistance is something you don't want them to do, redefine your metric. So, excuse me, so what's the point, right? We do rel regression testing to give us an idea of what's the relative quality, right? Failure is not a bad thing. In every agile project that I've worked on, failure is not a bad thing. Failing late or not knowing about it, that's a bad thing. But the motto on many projects over the last 15 years that I've been involved in agile projects has been fail early, fail fast, and resolve the failures, right? So regression really is about fail if there's a failure. Tell me what the known issues are. And we can look at failure rates over time to have that conversation about what is the quality of our product? Is it improving? The quality of a software product is not a, a single value, right? It is, are we better than the last release or are we seeing things degrade? Automation just gives us a mechanism to be more efficient in doing that regression testing, especially in a quick, rapid turnaround, do it often, right? Most agile projects, they wanna run tests, if not on every build, certainly on a daily basis, right? So if we look at automation and being efficient in doing regression testing, the probability that we're going to see a failure is going to go up as we add coverage. That just seems to, to make sense to me, right? But also, if there are code changes, change is risk. So if we're adding to the suite and or if we're making code changes, we're going to see a, a higher probability of failure. We also need to know, though, what are the existing known failures, right? What do we already know about? So Let's back up and talk about how our regression tests used. And this goes back to who's asking and who uses regression test results. Quality engineers want to know what failed and why, right? So we need some detailed logging in the, in the failures, right? And they want to have evidence of failure, right? They want to be able to see from that automated regression what happened and be able to identify was it a problem with the test or a problem with the product. And if it was a problem with the product, what is the problem? Right? The worst thing that can happen is you run a series of tests and they fail. And the first thing you have to do is rerun the test. Then you're not logging information properly. Right? But sometimes we want evidence of pass. If you're working in an FDA or a Department of Defense type of application, you need to be able to show that you executed the tests and that uh, here is the evidence of the execution and that it passed. Right? So you want to be able to capture those things. 
You also need to know what's new versus known. Did somebody file a bug on this already? That's what the, what, what the quality engineers, what the testers want to know. What about developers? Developers want to know what did I break? So again, they want to know what's new. What did the quality engineers already know about? and I'm making changes and I put I put some changes into the code and maybe I can run the regression test before I check my code in or merge it into the master branch. Well, what did I break, right? Management wants to know and they keep asking, are we green? Is everything passing? When will it be green? What they're really asking is, is quality improving? So if the question is, is quality improving, but green, means everything is passing, then we can't tell whether quality is improving. So should green really be the goal? In reality, what we're really trying to do is ascertain, is the code fit for use? Software is rarely bug free. Not all bugs will be fixed before a release. Sometimes they're cosmetics that we just say, you know what, these things don't line up on the page, but changes risk and we're not going to make that change at the last minute we'll fix it later so now we have an open defect but we're going to release the software anyway or there may be workarounds we may have lost some capability but it's not the primary way i had a i had a project where we lost the ability to print a map through a particular uh, convenience feature that we provided on one of the the menus but the analytics from our users said they hardly ever use that functionality. So when that was broken, one release, we decided there's a workaround. They have the primary way of doing it. We can come back and fix that later because the, again, we had to assess that risk. And there's also, I mentioned earlier, the opportunity costs. If we delay this release in order to fix all of the defects, do we miss our opportunity? Oftentimes on agile development projects, the program increments or the large chunks of, you know, three to five months of planning usually is focused around a show or a conference or a release of a uh, uh, full set of projects, right? The cost of missing one of those deadlines and not being able to present at a conference is huge, right? So we have to be able to manage these things and we will have open bugs. As long as we have failing tests that are associated with open bugs and those open bugs have been analyzed, triaged, and the product owner has said we're good with them, then we're okay. The problem is that failing tests always tell us it's red. If you have a failing test in your, in your regression suite, your tool is going to tell you it's red, right? And so green isn't necessarily the right goal, but red is pretty much constant. So how do we get to green? So I mentioned before, the metric mantra is beware the path of least resistance. So what do we do? Do we fix the bugs? Well, as I mentioned in the last slide, we have to deal with risk. We have to worry about uh, opportunity costs. So what do we do? Do we adjust the tests so that they pass? Um, we could, but the test case is now passing for behavior we don't want. But because we're driving for green, let's just adjust the test. Or, and I've seen this way too often, let's turn the tests off. If they fail, we'll turn them off because we know about those failures. Well, there's actually a couple of problems with that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But if we do any of these things, then poof, we're green. But I'd argue that those last two set us up for really bad behaviors and the possibility of missing problems. So let's back up and let's talk about test cases. Are they binary? Some of the tools will tell us that a test should fail for one and only one reason. We have the assertion model within unit testing frameworks that if you see a problem, fail immediately, right? And that's from the standpoint of unit testing when a developer says, oh, it's not doing what I want it to do, stop right now and let's fix that. And that's completely appropriate. But we're talking about quality engineers, we're talking about functional testing, end-to-end -end, uh, test scenarios. If I stop, 
when the first failure happens, there may be other failures I need to know about that I could move forward with the test case. But I'm stopping on the first one, right? So some frameworks have something called inconclusive results rather than pass and fail. You can do an inconclusive result MS test and their Azure DevOps uh, platform have this inconclusive uh, result, but we have to be careful how we use that. So in some cases, when we have a failure, the question is, did the product fail or did the test case fail? So pass means everything worked as expected. Fail means something did not work as expected. It may have been a behavior. It may have been a post condition of the test, something we're checking. But what is the state if we have a problem during preconditions? So we're trying to set up, for example, if it's a UI uh, that we're testing and we do a login and the login fails, should the test fail? Well, we haven't gotten to the functionality under test. We're just trying to fill in the preconditions. Maybe we're trying to load a file and we can't get the file loaded. Well, that doesn't mean that the print function is failing. So we don't really wanna fail the test. We certainly can't pass. If we have just one step or a post condition or we're unable to clean up, should the test fail? If it doesn't fail, we've somehow got to get some information out that says, hey, we've got a problem here. We can't clean up, right? So pass and fail, binary results are not good for functional testing. And we have to deal with this, when, what do we do with inconclusive results, right? And, and what color is inconclusive? When the software, the automated tests, can't tell us pass or fail. What color is inconclusive? Let's talk a little bit about the attributes of a test case and how that fits into a testing framework. So many of you have probably seen these before. Um, so tests have preconditions, the data and application state. The meat of the test is the behavioral expectations, the steps that we take that are actually testing the functionality under test, right? So you have a particular feature, you set up the preconditions, and now you have a behavior that you're gonna go through one to many steps and identify whether it's behaving the way you want it to. And once you're done with the behavior or maybe in the middle of that behavior, you're checking some post conditions. What data changed? How did the application state change? Uh, how did the view on a, in the case of the UI change? And then we have a result where all those expectations met. Well, right there, we can see there are multiple expectations. If you even have one behavioral step and one piece of data, there's two things you're checking, not one. So do we have a binary pass fail on test cases or do we have multiple uh, pass fail results in what we call test cases today? You want your test cases, of course, to be independent. You don't want test one test case to build on the previous test case because if that previous test case failed to do what you needed to do, now you have another test case that's dependent on it. Again, sometimes you can't avoid that, but is that a pass or a fail? You couldn't get to that functionality. We're talking about automated tests. You want them to be self-contained. Everything they need for preconditions are there and uniquely identified. Everything they need to attain that application state they're self-checking. We don't want humans to have to review the results. They should clean up after themselves. They should report the result, and hopefully somehow we get that result reported back into a repository against the software under test uh, version. So I want to dig into this one reason for failure a little bit more. Let's say we have an application provides a customer summary page with contact information, a map of that, their location, you know, their address, um, current balance, any open orders that have not been delivered with the delivery state, it's packaged, it's shipped, here's the tra tracking number, that type of thing. Think Amazon. Um, and then a delivered order list, right? So let's, this fictitious application, let's say for those five pieces of information, there are five direct API calls that are made for the page for testing the UI. There may be an unknown number of indirect service calls used underneath, right? So how many test cases do we have for that page? If we have one test case, you have five different things you're looking at. And you could argue that on the contact information, you may have 20 different items just in the contact information that you're looking at. 
well, is that one test case? Or is it five? Or is it for every piece that you look at on the page, right? What about if you're testing the, the APIs? You still have five different APIs, you're getting data back, and you're gonna be looking at the multiple pieces of information in the response packet. We have more than one potential failure here. If we want a failure to be specific to only one reason, then this test case has more than just one pass fail result. Remember, I mean, you could say, well, okay, we're gonna have a separate test case for each one of those, right? Well, UI tests are expensive. Uh, if you have to spin up a browser, log in, set up your preconditions, go and pull the customer summary page just to check the contact information, that test case is done, clean up, go to the con custom uh, map of the location test. Okay, that's got to log in, set up the precondition data, do the same thing, and each one of those spin up of a browser is expensive. Going from one page to the next is expensive. Right? You want to do everything you can once you get there. Remember that every one of those tests requires that login and navigation. That's, again, very expensive. You want to make the most out of the journey when you get there. So keep in mind those five things that we're looking at, the contact information, the map, the account balance, the order list, and the, the closed order, if you will, list. So what if on day one, the contact information is wrong and we have a new failure, so we file a bug, right? And we've tried to make good use of our time. We have one test case that navigates to that page and then looks at everything. Well, the first thing we looked at is the contact information. It failed, we filed a bug. Some days later, the delivery status isn't getting populated properly. That day one bug is still open, so the contact inf information is wrong. So that's not a new failure. We had one test case, and if we said we have one test case and it's binary, it either passes or it fails, will you look at this test? Well, it's not a new failure, but it implies that you're gonna have to look at it because there may be multiple failures for that test case. If you checked everything on that if you didn't check everything on that page, you wouldn't even know about this failure, right? If you, even though contact information failed, you still go on and you look at the other things. Now, again, you still have a single fail. It's a known failure, but it is a new failure. If you've got to look at every one of them, then your, your reporting isn't helping you any because you've got to go and look at every failure, whether you've analyzed it or not. If you're not, you're ignoring a new unknown failure. That's a problem. So if we had turned off the tests on day one, said, you know what, this test fails, we got a known problem, let's turn it off because it's a known problem, we're not gonna fix that problem, it's okay, you know, our, the, the zip plus four, let's say, is missing, we don't care, it's still usable, we'll fix it later, okay, we turn off the test. What does that mean? Well, guess what, we're green. Are we really? We've got a major functionality failure and we've masked it by turning the test off. And when I say turn the test off, we might have turned the test off or we might have modified the test to just say, you know what, just pass. Right? Still, we have a problem. So here's the proposal. We need a new target. This is not a, um, we can flip a switch. We have to be talking with our organizations and say, look, Green is not good. If you focus on green, people will turn off tests and we may not know about failures. You say those words to your product owner and they're gonna say, whoa, wait a minute. No, you have to tell me about everything we can know about this product. I'll make the determination whether we're gonna release or not. So the new target has to be yellow. It can't be green because the easiest way to get to green is to turn off failing tests that we quote unquote know about. So the proposal is we need a new target, yellow. It's the new green, remember? So what's the definition of this yellow metric? Right? First of all, we have no inconclusive results reported. Right? If you're using a tool like MS Test that allows you to do inconclusive, that means I couldn't get to the software functionality that I wanted to test. 
So we can't have any of those. If we have functionality we couldn't get to, it's got to be read because we don't know anything. However, if there are no inconclusives and all of the failing test results are associated with open bugs, and all of those open bugs have been triaged by our product owner. And there are no open bugs prioritized to be fixed before release. Then we can say, okay, it's, it's yellow, right? Any of these not being true, it's red, we have to stop, right? If green means go, red means stop, yellow means proceed with caution. If it's yellow, we can proceed with caution. If any of those th these uh, proposals are not true, for example, there are open bugs that have not been prioritized or that have been prioritized to go before the release, then we're red. We're not done fixing. Right. So this is the new yellow metric. So what do we need from our frameworks and from our test case management to support this yellow metric? Well, first of all, they need to provide us the ability to do non-binary test results. Some tools provide us to uh, provide us the ability to report step-by-step pass-fail results, but most of those still talk about well, you have a test case that has multiple steps. If any of the steps are a failure, the whole test case is a failure, and they only report at the test case level. We need them to report at the step or the assertion level. We need the ability to define this assertion, right? And have multiple results within a test case. Uh, at at uh, Magenic, which uh, recently merged with SoftVision, we have a tool called Max that um, we implemented something called soft asserts. They look just like asserts in the normal unit testing framework. They will set the failure for that assertion if it fails but they allow you to move on so you don't hit an assert and the framework goes oh we failed stop right like the unit testing frameworks do the soft assert says mark this step as failure but continue on and that's under the control of the software developer who writes the test we have to have the ability to have an inconclusive result reported so that we understand hey we've got We've got an issue here, this is inconclusive. You could argue that in the definition, this new target being yellow, that something being inconclusive equates to red. The problem with that is if I'm looking at the results, I see red that tells me that functionality I'm testing didn't work. Inconclusive says, I don't know. And that's where potentially a yellow result for an individual uh, test report or a test result would be helpful. We need the ability to combine the metrics, not only the failures, but also any related defects. So we need to know what constitutes a real failure. If it's a failure, but there's an open defect and the target release is a later release, great, that tells us this is no longer red, it's yellow. Right? that contributes to that yellow. It's known, it's a prioritized bug, we can go with yellow. So in conclusion, driving for green regression testing is bad. I think I, I pointed out earlier, the easiest thing to do is to turn off a test and it's also a really bad idea. Driving for green on our regression testing is bad. Unless, I will provide this caveat, if you are working in some of those industries where you have to run all tests, there's no way you can turn off tests and everything has to pass, that, that's an exception. For most of us working on uh, commercial software, um, not human life rated software, driving the green te regression testing result is actually a bad thing. And that's because the quality state of an application is a conversation. It isn't a stoplight. We have to have that conversation with our product owners about here are the known failures that you've assessed. I worked on a project some years ago, probably about 10 years ago, where we were doing this and we would sit down and the each time the test failed and we filed a bug, it immediately went to a triage uh, queue that we triaged every morning. The product owner said, yeah, I'm okay with that one. But as we got close to the release, we were looking at those 
as a whole. And the product owner would say, I'm okay with each one of those individually, but as a group, we're gonna suffer a death by a thousand cuts. We have to um, look at the whole conversation, not just that an individual uh, triage and decide, are we willing to release with all of that? And that's a conversation. That's not something you can just create a formula on and says, well, if there's more than X number of failures that even if they're known, we're not gonna go anyway, right? That, that's a conversation that has to have. Again, results are not a binary function, right? The state of the quality is not the result of a binary function. So we need this yellow metric, right? It's, it's not binary, we have red, yellow, and green, but yellow raises the flag that says, hey, have a conversation. It's not green, it's close, but it's not there yet. We need test reporting tools uh, that support this. They're getting better, but slowly, and we need a little revolution, if you will, right? We all need to reach out to our vendors and say, hey, how are you supporting this a little bit more complicated metric, but it allows us to have that quality conversation. We have to start with the frameworks first, right? If we don't have automation frameworks that support multiple pass fails within a test case and the ability to say, it's not pass, it's fa not fail, I don't know, right? If we don't have that, then the reporting tools aren't gonna be able to handle it because they're not getting that information. But we also need to throw the elephant, as they say, right? We need to manage our management expectations. Let's be honest. We all know that management likes an easy button. They like to be able to look up at a radiator, look up at a, at a monitor on the wall and say, it's green, we can go, it's red, we can't, right? But we have to manage the management expectations and say, no, the quality state is a conversation, right? If everything is truly green, then we can make a mindless decision, but we aren't in the business of making mindless decisions. So green can be get bad, Maybe yellow is the new green. I thank you very much for joining me for this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, my contact email is there as well as Twitter. And I do have a blog called the QED Evangelist uh, that uh, I'd be glad to hear. I, I post sometimes to it. I'm glad to hear your comments on this and other subjects uh, or contact me through Twitter or email. I'd be glad to answer your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to do this conference in person, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to share my thoughts on this subject with you. And again, I thank you very much. Have a great day.